Hello everyone, my name is Protesilaos, also known as Prot. In this presentation, I want to talk to you about matters of disposition. How we conduct ourselves in a social setting. What is our sense of self and how we can cope with the relevant challenges. The idea is to use practical examples and connect them to abstract concepts. Studying everyday scenario makes it easier for us to understand the meaning of those abstractions. We can discern them in facts we are already familiar with. We go from the particulars to the general, while from the general we can better comprehend the combinations between the particulars. We start thinking in terms of relations and systems. As always, the text of this presentation is available on my website and the link is uh, here. Uh, but if you are watching this on the video hosting platform, uh, the link will be available in the description. And from my website, you can find links to uh, the rest of my work. So everything is available there. So the contents of today's uh, presentation. Uh, some definitions, just a couple of uh, terms that I will use in a few places. Uh, Self-doubt, expectations and ideals. Misused idealism and insecurity. Selfhood, ownership and insecurity. Selfhood and the comfort zone. And finally, a few words uh, in uh, conclusion, to be careful with how we use uh, ideals. Uh, so let's uh, expand uh, those uh, headings and get into the focus mode. And let's start with the definitions. I will use two Greek words in this presentation. So I have to tell you what they mean. The one is akthisia, akthisia which means non-ownership, else the state of not having possessions. And I will explain this, what it means in practice in this uh, presentation. And the other one is ataraxia, ataraxia, which means non-disturbance or what we would call uh, tranquility, else a state where one is not moved or pressured by evolving states of affairs. And again, I will explain uh, this uh, in context so you will see how it fits in with uh, the topic of today's presentation. Hints to or mentions of uh, those concepts can be found in my previous uh, videos on philosophy as well as uh, other works. Uh, as a starting point, you can check uh, the relevant section of my website for entries with the video tag, uh, but uh, you don't have to worry about it as uh, this is a standalone presentation. I will explain everything that you need to know about it. Of course, <laughs> reading uh, won't uh, harm you, but uh, just saying that it's not a prerequisite. Next section, self-doubt expectations and ideals. Self-doubt is when you question yourself. You want to have a healthy dose of skepticism and do a reality check from time to time. This is fruitful. It ensures you do not get absorbed in your own subjective narrative of selfhood and all the misunderstandings that may go with it. The tricky thing with self-doubt is that it can easily be mishandled. If done carelessly, it turns into self-denial. This is a state of mind where you refuse to give credit to yourself. It no longer manifests as a questioning attitude or a form of criticism. There is nothing fair about it. It is a polemic, an attack against everything you do. Self-doubt turns into self-denial when we set unrealistic expectations about ourselves. For example, 
We notice uh, this uh, in people from a young age when they develop issues about their body image. They see all those highly edited uh, pictures in magazines or TV and they get this idea that they are ugly. Then the self-denial moves from a perception of ugliness into self-loathing and ultimately self-hate. The person feels worthless. While beauty standards are an obvious case we can all relate to immediately, they are not the only one. In society we have standards for practically everything. How we should express ourselves, how we are perceived as professionals at the workplace, what our income or status says about our character, who we should have relationships with, and so on. Everything we do has a standard. There is an ideal made out of it. Whether this ideal is correct or does not really, uh, sorry, whether this idea is correct or not, does not really matter for our immediate experience with it. For instance, we may say that modern beauty standards are inhumane. But that does not solve the problem, the real problem, for people who are already feeling the pressure to be so-called beautiful. Ideals are not inherently wrong. I am not saying that the reason we develop self-hate is because we have ideals. No. I am hinting at the need for a balanced approach in understanding what an ideal represents. Ideals are mental constructs. They are representations of patterns we observe uh, in the world. We trace the common in the multitude of various phenomena and we turn that into a concept. We basically keep a perfect version of the pattern in our head. Think, for example, how we derive the notion of dog. We observe all sorts of specimens. Small dogs, large dogs, service dogs, catch dogs and so on. There are many breeds, land races, and mixtures between them. Our abstract dog, then, must not have specific attributes, because those will not exist in all actual dogs. If, say, the ideal dog uh, had long hair, then we would have to rule out all short-haired dogs as a different species. That would be wrong. So the dog concept needs to be abstract and sufficiently generic to cover all specimens. All ideals are generic in this way, otherwise they remain open to review. Since I mentioned uh, beauty standards, think about the ideal of beauty. We cannot limit it to how humans look because then we cannot admire a sunset by saying, oh, this is beautiful. We also can't see the beauty in a piece of art or in an elegant program and so on. As such, beauty has to be generic as well, and the same for all ideals. Strictly speaking, generic representations are not actual in our world. Everything we have is instantiated, it is made specific, with certain attributes. There is no such thing, for example, as a generic dog with no particular uh, skull size, for example. It has to have a head and that head will have to have a specific bone structure. The gist is that the actual cannot be ideal. The ideal cannot be actual. Same thing. We can thus infer that ideals do not exist directly, 
they do exist as patterns in this world which are discernible but they do not get to be experienced as such we can only understand ideals through their instantiations for example we get what dog is because we have seen or interacted with all sorts of dogs so we have a pretty good idea of what the abstraction of those would be uh, the more we know about uh, the, par the particulars the finer and more generic our ideal will be the point then is to appreciate the role that ideals play in our everyday life we cannot become uh, the ideal student the ideal profession the ideal friend the ideal philosopher, and so on. We can only ever have approximations of those mental images. To use ideals properly, we need to avoid the common mistake of thinking that they can exist as such. Imagine that you will only settle for the ideal lover. Well, I have bad news for you. You will always be disappointed as such a person cannot exist. Our ideals are perfect and generic, but everything that is an instantiation of them has to be imperfect and specific by comparison. Humans are imperfect throughout, all of us. Ideals are used correctly when they are our guides to action we want to have a criterion that helps us decide in any given situation which among the alternatives is the closest to its perfect form we do this with knowledge of the fact that we live in a world of imperfections the ideal thus serves as the proxy of the good, not as its enemy. It is here where self-denying folks commit an error. And this includes me from a few years ago, so I am not blaming you out there. The error is in believing that we can have ideals in our life. Perfectly honest people, genuinely cooperative colleagues, pure intentions, and so on. When we have this notion that ideals can exist, we necessarily operate with the expectation that they should exist. We wait and wait until we find them. Though as the years go by and we don't get ideals in our life, we start to grow anxious and become unsettled. We are disappointed. Why can't people just be perfect? We wonder. These sort of unfulfilled expectations can then turn us into naysayers. We become unfair with things and this makes us dogmatic. It is how we end up hating ourselves and the world at large. We see that we cannot uh, have perfect beauty so we go to the other extreme of insisting that we are uh, absolutely repulsive idealism thus begets negativity and frustration when it is not used uh, correctly it leads to the propensity to dismiss the worth in things the person who is an idealist has to be able to distinguish between what they want and what is possible. I am speaking in conceptual uh, terms here. By possible, I do not mean what is politically expedient or appropriate in the given cultural milieu or institutional order. I am referring to the impossibility of ideals ever being actualized, as I already stated. It is fine to have ideals. We want to have them. The key is to learn how to use them properly. 
They help us aspire to our highest, but they must not be used against us or against the rest of the world. We want the ideal to empower us, to go from the available to the good, from the good to the better, from the better to the best. We do not want ideals to be used as a reason to punish ourselves and to dismiss everything this life has to offer. The self-denying and ultimately self-hating fellow must be understood as an idealist who applies ideals incorrectly. It is an imbalanced method, a method that is not informed by wisdom. Next section, misused idealism and insecurity. Let's return to the example with the issues people have about their body image. I am using this because it is relatable to all of us. These people have developed, or been indoctrinated into, an idealized notion of what it means to be beautiful, which they then use to belittle and ultimately reject what they have. For whatever reason, they do not acknowledge that ideals cannot be instantiated as ideals. Idealists who are misguided in this way are dogmatic in how they take the ideal for granted. They do not criticize it. They do not try to think that maybe, just maybe, something is amiss. Television, marketing, social media, all reinforce certain stereotypes which are misconstrued as objective ideals. I say misconstrued because they are not sufficiently generic as ideals ought to be. They are inane standards, they capture something very specific. People are not at fault. When seemingly everyone out there holds those views, we become intimidated in even questioning them. It takes a lot of courage to say, hold on a moment, this is a lie. Most people will not do that because they are inclined or conditioned to go with the majority and to play it safe. So a cultural construct appears in the mind as a universal constant. The thinking is that this is what beauty is, full stop. And that view does not tolerate any counterpoints. Due to the way it is framed, the misguided idealist is prone to develop tunnel vision and intolerance of alternative views. They will judge everything on the basis of their narrowly conceived ideal. For example, they will assess the worth of a person based exclusively on their looks. They won't care if the person is nice, knowledgeable, has a sense of humor, sensitivities about art or whatnot. It is an all or nothing kind of deal based on appearances alone. The false ideal and its inconsiderate application thus inhibits the person from experiencing the world as it actually is, with all its flaws and imperfections, with its complexity, and with the multifaceted reality of its beings. Society, with its culture, plays a catalytic role in how we think about ourselves. I have explained this point in greater detail in a previous presentation uh, about uh, selfhood. The link is here, but as I said, uh, the text of the presentation is available on my website, so you can follow the link from there. The gist is that we use the opinions of others about who we are as one, confirmation of our thoughts, or two, we try to become who others think 
we should be. Usually there is a combination between those two, so it's not, uh, it's not always neat and uh, tidy. Either way, our selfhood is not a strictly private affair. It emerges through intersubjective modes of behavior. We can already get a sense of this intersubjectivity by thinking again about how ideas that find currency in our uh, environment influence the behavior of individuals. Societies establish rules which define roles for classes of its members. If a person has uh, certain characteristics or is in a given situation, they have to act in accordance with the requirements of the role. It's no longer about the person as such, but rather about the institution, the role carried out by the person. Um, when we take those roles for granted, we become the institution. We are who the roles of the game demand that we ought to be. And this is where the line between one's notional true self, as we would call it, and their culturally instituted self is blurred. We cannot really have a person in a decontextualized state to determine what comes from their environment and what doesn't. So we have to take selfhood as this subjective narrative, which, at the very least, has strong intersubjective influences. Uh, just to um, correct a typo that I noticed uh, here, and moving on to the next page. But let me be practical here, as I may be becoming a, a bit vague. I want to help you follow my line of reasoning and see how philosophy is a practical affair. I don't need to tell you about all the falsehoods we find on the internet, though imagine this caricature of the social media influencer. They will post what is considered a hot picture with the caption, be yourself and uh, a heart emoji. Contrary to the salient point of be yourself, they will take a hundred shots to find the one that flatters their figure the most. They will likely heavily modify the photograph to remove blemishes or perhaps add more emphatic curves here and there. You know how it works. The issue is that those who are already misusing ideals do not critically assess this sort of publication. They don't notice the disconnect between what is shown and what is stated. Instead, they get feedback that reinforces their already dogmatic attitude and feeds into their growing insecurity or warped expectations. They see an influencer showing off what so-called beauty is supposed to be, and they are, well, influenced to think accordingly and to propagate those beliefs. As for the meaning of the message to be yourself in such cases, it is but idle talk. Honesty is here sacrificed to the altars of social validation, instant gratification, and outright hypocrisy. There is nothing substantive about it. I am not blaming the influencer, though, as they too are a victim uh, of those very standards they vindicate and embody. But more on this uh, a bit later. Extend this mechanism to all cases where standards and concomitant social expectations are involved. The person who is misusing idealism gets the message that this is how things ought to be. Due to their uh, wrong mindset, due to their dogmatism, those people will then 
conclude that those are the reasons why they are worthless as a person. Insecurity comes from self-consciousness of one's perceived limitations as seen from the imaginary social eye. This is key. The belief that there exists an omniscient and ubiquitous judge out there that will punish us for our every misstep. Of course, this is not limited to the example I have used with beauty standards, though that gives us a fairly good indication of how things work. Insecurity is fueled by the belief we have that we are not good enough. We are conditioned to assign value to all those lofty targets and we ultimately feel inferior to them. Even when we find ourselves in a new situation, we assume that those standards still apply or that something relevant is in force. Thus, our self-impression is that of the imposter. Deep down, we have this self-doubt that pushes towards self-denial as we think we are incompetent and start hating who we are. We do not question the presence of this social I as we are used to it in every situation. We know that people judge others for everything. We would rather not find ourselves in that position. We wish to be loved or generally to feel safe. We are extra careful. Yet there is a fine line dividing caution from prejudice and relevant self-fulfilling prophecies. If we truly believe that we are an imposter, then all of our actions will be defined by this pervasive sense of insecurity. We will look insecure and consequently appear incompetent exactly because that is how we are operating. Next section, selfhood, ownership and insecurity. I believe that uh, at the core of insecurity lies the intuitive belief we have about ownership. We think that every critique is an attack on our person, as we are of the view that our self has specific attributes that we cherish and want to hold on to. Uh, we perceive criticism as an attempt to deprive us of those things we think we own. For example, if someone says that we are wrong, we become defensive because we fear that our intelligence or pride or something related is under threat. We do not want to lose what we think is ours. Do we own anything though? The belief in ownership, oh, sorry, ownership is deeply embedded in our conduct. We take it for granted. You may be thinking that this question I just asked is some kind of trick. But I do not play games. I am serious and want you to think about this topic very carefully. Do we own anything? We think we own stuff due to the association we make of their joint presence or correlation. For instance, our sense of self involves the notion of how good our memory is. We take this as a definitive characteristic of who we are. Though it is not truly inalienable, meaning that it can be taken away from us. Under certain conditions, our organism as a human may develop in ways that do not include this attribute. You slip, hit your head, and sustain an injury that causes a permanent condition. You no longer have what you thought was yours. It's as simple as that. Consider your appearance, your beauty, or whatever else. You really care about it. It defines who you are. 
Is it yours though? Who owns what? Can you truly hold on to it no matter what? You cannot. You definitely cannot. Whatever you think is yours is so by coincidence. It is not a necessary relationship. We need to understand how the universe works and accept what is transient as just that. Our presence and all of its attributes are ephemeral and coincidental. They are contingent on a multitude of factors. We tend to think of ourselves in a vacuum. Even the expression I just used of presence and all of its attributes is an analytical construct, a product of thought. In practice, those different names uh, of uh, presence and attributes do not exist as standalone magnitudes that can be neatly separated. We do not consider the intersubjectivity of selfhood that I already explained, but we also forget about the natural order. Our presence in the cosmos is always, always framed, informed, conditioned, influenced, or otherwise determined by factors beyond our control. What our actuality is, is not simply a function of our volition, else free will. We cannot be whomever we want, no matter what. The prevailing conditions delineate a horizon of possibilities. The main insight for us right now is that ownership is an illusion. We do not own anything. Not our looks, not our brains, not our self. Whoever you think you are, there is always a chance that you are refashioned into someone else, given the right triggers or modifications in the constitution of the case, in the factors whose interplay affects your presence. Everything we think we own is alienable, meaning that it can be taken away from us and be rendered alien vis-a-vis -vis our person, conceptually speaking. We understand this point with possessions like our phone or clothes, even though we have an elaborate legal institutional order that envisages and safeguards property rights. We know that property is conventional and that it does not exist without the instituted reality that enables it. We just extend this principle to what we consider our internal world or our uh, qualities, whatever those are. We thus arrive at akthisia, the Greek word I mentioned in the definition, one of the two Greek words. This is the state of, of non-ownership, akthisia. We acknowledge that owning stuff is an illusion. It is based on the instinct we have for self-preservation, which establishes in us a bias in favor of certain beliefs. We assume we own ourself, our body, our possessions, simply because this helps us survive. That's perfectly fine. Though when we do philosophy, we start developing what I have explained before as the mystical side of our being. And that was in the presentation Ataraxia, Moderation and uh, Mysticism. The link is here, but again, uh, you will find it on my website. Mystic, Mysticism, Mysterious and Related Concepts have to do with initiation in a corpus of knowledge or way of thinking. If we encounter something we do not know, 
we think it is mysterious, though this merely indicates uh, our ignorance. The subject matter is not inherently unintelligible or incomprehensible. It is just unknown to us, as we have not been initiated in the relevant school of thought or discipline. Our mystical side, the one that is informed by wisdom, is the least developed of our facets, as opposed to instincts. But as we cultivate our mystical qualities, we begin to overcome the built-in prejudices we have. This happens organically. It is the product of a lifelong commitment to philosophy. By understanding things at a deeper level, we no longer have this impression of self-centeredness. We do not think that the whole world revolves around us and that we somehow are special. We ultimately do not even operate on the basis of our ego. Acticia, however, is a profound realization that requires a lot of work. It is not something we learn over the weekend and then carry on with our routines. It changes our life. When we do not admit to Acticia, we assume that we own ourselves. We then think that we also own everything that is an extension of ourselves. For example, we are emotionally invested in our projects or ideas. We want them to succeed and be proven right. This is a way for our ego to find fulfillment. We defend them, the projects or ideas, as if we were fighting for our survival, exactly because we take them as our possessions, as a part of who we are. This links back to insecurity. When we labor under the prejudice that we own stuff which are alienable, we fear that we might lose them. And as we associate our selfhood with them, we are afraid that a loss of this sort constitutes a diminution of who we are. Insecurity, then, is fueled by the justifiable, albeit mistaken, presumption of ownership. Here I will say something you may find strange. Confidence is just like insecurity. They are two sides of the same coin, for it too is an attitude that is predicated on ownership. Confidence also requires that we have things we can cling on to, things which define us as unalterable and give us this seemingly unflinching resolve. Both insecurity and confidence are fragile because they spring from a baseless belief of owning ourself and all of its apparent extensions. Given the appropriate stimuli, these thoughts can be exposed and be undone, leading to the collapse of everything built on top of them. Admitting to Acticia thus helps us overcome such a dichotomy and its precarious state. We all want to be confident. Confidence is the best thing possible, or, or so we believe. Though confidence presupposes commitment to an illusory state of affairs, which is reducible to the claim that we have inalienable, uh, 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 that we have that what we have rather is inalienable and it is also uh, permanent. 
This leads me to the next point. The illusion of ownership comes with another presumption, the belief in permanence. However, our life and every aspect of it is impermanent. Our notion of self evolves over time, from our teenage years to adulthood and as we grow older. It depends on our experiences and social interactions, among others. Our appearance changes as well, as does our inner world and everything else. We know about this. We are readily aware of it. Though we do not think deeply of impermanence, as doing so would challenge our view of ownership. There may be a built-in resistance there, though it is not insurmountable. Once we get past that initial hesitation and admit to impermanence, we also notice how what we take for granted in our life is contingent on a multitude of factors beyond our control. And then we ultimately arrive at the admission of acticia. When we reach that point, we are finally freed from the biases that fuel both insecurity and confidence. There is no longer a fear that we may lose something or an aspiration that we might gain something else. As we already know, that we cannot truly own anything. Acticia is a state of mind. It is not that suddenly we have no self, no appearance, no recognizable attributes. We are still human. It just means that we are not attached to those qualities or their derivatives. We are not emotionally invested in them. If we have something, we are okay. If we lose it, we are okay. In other words, we remain indifferent. Such is a state of ataraxia, else tranquility. Ataraxia is the other Greek word I mentioned in the definitions. We operate with aloofness. There is no fear no desires, no past or future. There is a lightness to our being where we merely operate in the here and now unencumbered by all those burdens we would otherwise carry on our back. Next section. Selfhood and the comfort zone. Ataraxia changes how we live our life. We are no longer going through a constant struggle of trying to maintain our happiness, to accumulate more things, or to fight for what we consider as rightfully ours. Through acticia, we overcome the bias of egocentrism. The ego is like an insatiable monster that keeps asking for more. But once we escape from its grip, we simply accept what happens to be the case. This brings me to the topic of one's comfort zone. We often hear, or may even say it ourselves, that we need to relax and just be comfortable with who we are. Be yourself, right? The idea is to practice self-love and to not try to conform with whatever inane standard. If we think about the examples I provided earlier, such as with the beauty standard, this advice is fecund. It can help people avoid the suffering associated with the impossibility of conforming with an unrealistic criterion. That's good. However, to be yourself does not guarantee that you start walking on the right path. 
it might be that you remain misguided, driven by cultural norms, instinctive biases, and so on. There is nothing in self-love that ensures emancipation from fear and desires. It is better than a living hell, sure, though it still is problematic in its own ways. I have said before that sometimes the comfort zone is but a prison that we have gotten used to and thus consider a cozy environment. It makes us feel good superficially due to our familiarity with it. Though this may well be a case of the evil you know is better than the one you don't. I am sure you have heard this expression before, or at least something like it. It basically captures the view that familiarity uh, is uh, giving us a sense of comfort even when it is not really good. The problem with trying to practice self-love and to just be yourself is that your selfhood is likely to be predicated on years of experience and conduct that are biased in major ways. Think about someone who has always been insecure. They have the propensity to guard themselves from getting exposed by planning everything ahead of time. They tend to have a prefigured response to every stimulus or social interaction. And when they are caught in an unfamiliar situation, they tend to panic. This is an older version of me. I am not blaming anyone. I used to operate in ways that would allow me to be in a controlled environment. This would help me figure out all possible outcomes and decide in advance how best to react. Though this seldom works, as life is complex and our neat schemes tend to not correspond with the state of affairs. Hence, the anxiety and panic attacks. Now, if we tell such a person to simply love who they are, we are not doing them any kind of favor. We are, in effect, encouraging them to stay in their prison. It's like we are saying, oh, but your cage is so pretty. Whereas what we really want when we conduct ourselves with wisdom is to help people overcome their own worst enemy, their fears, their desires, their expectations, their ego. And this applies to all folks not just those who are insecure, like past me. It is the same for the person who appears confident, or even for that social media influencer I mentioned earlier. They all are under some kind of pressure to conform with standards. They are victims of expectations. And they all dread losing what they think they have, their beauty, their popularity, their success, their social circle, or what not. What happens if the influencer gets zero attention? Are they okay with it? Are they still an influencer? They do not admit to acticia and therefore cannot attain ataraxia. Next and uh, final question, folks. Be careful with ideals. Let me return to the theme of what ideals are. We don't want to get into the mindset of wanting or hoping for some ideal to be actualized. This cannot happen. Ideals that are formulated with wisdom are our guide uh, in life. We use them to make 
practical decisions and deal with specific circumstances. But we know where they belong. Furthermore, remember what I covered in my previous presentation on who can be a philosopher. Again, the link is in the text and you will find it on my website. The key uh, takeaway is that uh, philosophy is based on patience. We cannot have wisdom without being patient. We cannot achieve sophistication in haste. We cannot be profound while remaining at the level of superficialities and so on. Please check my presentation if you need the details. The point is that akthisia and ataraxia are concepts that can be misused as well. We are imperfect and tend to seek the course of action that requires the least amount of effort. We should not commit the error of thinking that all of a sudden we will become an absolutely immovable object, uh, object sorry, that subsists in perfect harmony. This is not realistic. Similarly, we should not have a ceremonial or tokenistic understanding of those uh, ideas. If, for example, you throw away your phone, you do not uh, necessarily reach that point of embedding acticia in your modus vivendi. Maybe you are working towards that direction, though you need to be mindful of what the substance is and not remain limited to the appearances. What I am saying here is not a glorification or rationalization of poverty or the simple life. To lead a simple life is but a side effect of the recognition that we do not own anything but we must get the order right and understand what comes first. In practical terms, let me share a few things about myself, the insecurities I once had, and how I now operate with aloofness. Not confidence, mind you, but aloofness. Very different. I used to be afraid to speak in public. I thought that everyone around me was a preeminent expert and that somehow I had cheated my way uh, into their company. I felt I was an imposter. I dreaded speaking as I believed it would expose my presumed charade and that everybody would then laugh at me for how ignorant I truly was. It was the same with written communication. I had to read an email over and over again to check for typos and to painstakingly explain every inconsequential detail. Why? Because I thought my language skills were not up to par. Also because I did not want to expose what I considered to be my ignorance. Again, this feeling of being an imposter. I only managed to overcome those impediments with my transition to philosophy. I became a philosopher through trial and error uh, in life experiences. Not books, not formal education. The short version of the story is that it was a painful transition after which I was effectively remade. Compare the fearful me to the attitude I have now. For example, I started using Emacs uh, three years ago. In case you don't know, this is a special program that looks like a text editor, but actually is an integrated computing environment, an advanced uh, program, let's say. I was not a programmer, though I was indifferent about it, and thus had neither fear 
nor desire. I was free from all the burdens. So I started using Emacs and eventually learned to be good at it. Now I maintain all those programs I wrote uh, for Emacs. You see how this works? Same principle for uh, these philosophy videos that I am doing. I don't do them because I think I am the foremost expert on any of the topics I have covered. In fact, I don't have any formal qualification as a philosopher, if that matters. Previous me would have been intimidated to ever do this, out of fear of being branded as a charlatan. Such is the bias of ownership, of losing something we think we have. Yet here I am, aloof, with a lightness to my disposition. I have nothing to prove, nothing to gain, nothing to lose. I am merely sharing those words as others might find them useful for their own life. And if they don't, well, I didn't lose anything. To the question, who do you think you are? I blithely, I happily reply with Protesilaos, also known as Prot. Nice to meet you. All this is simple, perhaps deceptively so. Same as with what I said before about patience. That too sounds easy, but it isn't. It takes a lot of work and requires commitment, though this is a case of doing the basic things right. It is not some deep secret that only the special ones or some elite knows about. I thus ask you to reflect on your condition. Think carefully about your insecurity or your confidence, your achievements, your personhood. Consider all those things you take for granted. Are they yours? What are you afraid of, really? That's all for today, folks. Thank you very much for your attention. As I said, the text of this presentation uh, will be available on my website. The link is here, but it will also be available in the description of this video if you are watching it on the video hosting platform. So that's all for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, goodbye, folks.